In this chapter, we're going to investigate new ways of dealing with quadratic equations, that is, new ways to solve quadratic equations. Up to this point, we've used the method of factoring. Let's begin just by reviewing the method of factoring. We understand that if we have a quadratic equation like this, our prescription up to this point is to put all the terms on one side and factor. Well, let's do that. We put the terms on one side here by subtracting 14 on both sides. Then we factor this trinomial into x plus 7 times x minus 2. At this point, we simply ask ourselves what value of x will cause each factor to become 0. This factor becomes 0 when x is negative 7. That factor becomes 0 when x is 2. So negative 7 and 2 are the solutions to the equation. Now, before we leave the method of factoring, I would like to show you an interesting nuance. When we have a, actually this is not a quadratic equation, it's a third degree equation, but we can solve it using the method of factoring. We uh, look for a common factor in these two terms. We find that 3x is common to both terms, so we snag 3x out of this term, leaving x squared. 3x out of this term leaves minus 25. Now, we see that we have the difference of squares here, so we factor into the sum of terms times the difference of terms. The point I want to make here is that once we are in a factored form, we ask ourselves what value of x will cause each factor to become 0. Now, I'm thinking of 3x as a common factor here. I know that 3 and x are separate factors, but let's think of the factor as 3x. All right. So 3x is a factor, x plus 5 is a factor, x minus 5 is a factor, and we're asking ourselves what value of x will make each of these factors 0. Well, if x is replaced with 0, then 0 times 3 would make this factor 0. So x equals 0 is a solution. Now, this factor is 0 when x is negative 5, and this factor is 0 when x is 5. All right, so we have three solutions to this equation. Now, I want to show you a, an equation that looks very much like this, but the set of solutions is quite a bit different. Here we have 3x squared minus 75. Take out a common factor. The common factor is 3. Now we're left with x squared minus 25, which factors into x plus 5 times x minus 5. At this point, we ask ourselves the exact same question. What value of x will cause each factor to become 0? Now, what value of x causes each factor to become 0? There is no x involved in this common factor, and therefore no value of x is going to cause that factor to become 0. Our solutions are simply the values of x that cause these two factors to be 0, that is, x equals negative 5 and x equals 5. Now, the point I'm making here is that there's a commonly made mistake where when, when students get it into their minds that this situation can occur, that is, when we have a common factor, that that factor will often give off a solution of x equals 0. Now, once you, that discovery is made, the, uh, the commonly made mistake is to think that every single time there's a common factor, then we have one of the solutions being 0. But here we have a common factor, and this does not provide us with a, another solution of x being equal to 0 because it doesn't contain x. That common factor must contain the variable in order for us to, to generate a solution from it. Okay. Let's go on about the business at hand. We're going to uh, talk about a new method of solving quadratics called extracting square roots. Now, if we're faced with x squared equals 25, we could uh, take this term and move it to this side and factor into the sum of terms times the difference of terms and get these two uh, as our solutions, these two values of x as solutions. There is another way to proceed, though. Just think about the notion <coughs> that if x is some real number, and that real number is to be squared to give 25, what real numbers can be squared to give 25? Well, 5 can be squared to give 25, <coughs> and negative 5 can be squared to give 25. Now, <coughs> we can find those values by taking the positive and negative square root of 25. That is, x is either plus or minus the square root of 25. And this is the notion about extracting square roots. You see, it is uh, that it's sort of like taking the square root on both sides, but, but not quite. It's, it's really that a variable squared set equal to a real number, a variable squared set equal to a real number. In that circumstance, that variable is equal to plus or minus the square root of the real number. Now here we have x equals plus or minus 5, and those represent 
our two answers. So extracting square roots. Now this allows us to, uh, to solve quadratic equations that would otherwise be unfactorable. That is, now we saw a factoring method associated with this one. But look at this one. X squared equals 7. Now if we're going to use the factoring method on this one, we would kick the 7 to this side. We would have X squared minus 7 equals 0, and we would attempt to factor. But this is not the difference of squares. So by the methods that we understand, this is unfactorable, or at least it's very inconvenient to factor. So we'll resort to the method of solution uh, called extracting square roots. And it's the notion that we have a variable quantity squared set equal to a real number. So that variable quantity is plus or minus the square root of the real number. And that's all there is to it. And here are our two solutions. x is plus the square root of 7, or x is minus the square root of 7. And we can actually check to see if this is indeed, or these are indeed, uh, valid solutions. You see, take the original equation, x squared equals 7, and replace x with the values we found for it. If x is plus or minus the square root of 7, when we square positive numbers, we get a positive result. When we square negative numbers, we get a positive result. All right, now squaring the square root of 7, the squaring uh, we'll undo the square rooting, and so we'll just get 7 on the left, and on the right we have 7. So we have truth and a valid solution. All right. In order to, uh, to solve by extracting square roots, the variable quantity which is squared should be isolated on one side of the equation. Here we have 2x squared equals 20. And the approach that we want to use is to, to isolate the x squared by dividing on both sides by 2. So we divide on both sides by 2. We find x squared to be 10. And x then, by extracting square roots, is plus or minus the square root of 10, our two solutions. Here again, we can use extracting square roots. Now, on the previous uh, examples, we were talking about x being squared. But any variable quantity, any unknown quantity which is squared, set equal to a real number, is a candidate for using uh, extracting square roots. Here's the variable quantity that's squared, set equal to a real number. So that variable quantity is plus or minus the square root of the real number. x minus 2, then, is equal to plus or minus 5. x then, adding 2 on both sides, is 2 plus or minus 5. Now, this really represents two solutions. One of them is 2 plus 5, the other is 2 minus 5. So, here are the two solutions. 2 plus 5, 7. 2 minus 5, negative 3. So, x is 7 or negative 3. These two uh, solve this equation. Let's verify them. If x is 7, we have 7 minus 2, that's 5. 5 squared is 25. 25 equals 25, truth. If x is negative 3, we have negative 3 minus 2, that's negative 5 squared, which is also 25. 25 equals 25, truth. So these are valid solutions. Here's a, another situation where we're going to use extracting square roots, but remember we want to isolate the variable part that's squared as a first order of business. Here we would isolate that the binomial squared by dividing on both sides by 2. So we divide over here by 2 and we get the cancellation as expected, so we have x plus 3 squared. On the right, when we divide by 2, we get 7. Now by extracting square roots, x plus 3 is plus or minus the square root of 7. And isolating the x, because we want to make the equation tell us the solutions, you see, we'll subtract 3 on both sides to find x to be minus 3 plus or minus the square root of 7. And now it's inconvenient to try to collect minus 3 plus root 7 and then minus 3 minus root 7. So this really represents our two solutions. Do understand, though, that this representation means two things. It means, and we might not write this every time, but this means x is minus 3 plus the square root of 7, and the other solution is minus 3 minus the square root of 7. And both of these are contained in this one statement using the plus or minus.
The method of solving quadratic equations uh, by extracting square roots is sometimes called using the square root property. So we may refer to it in one of those ways or another. But using the square root property or extracting square roots, you notice that the equation has to be in a very particular form. We have to have some uh, unknown quantity squared on one side of the equation and a real number on the other side. Well, equations, quadratic equations, don't often come to us delivered in this particular uh, kind of form. They often come to us in a more expanded kind of form. Now, let's just take this equation, and I'll, I'll work upward here, and I'll expand this. x minus 3 squared is x squared minus 6x plus 9 equals 7. And then if I put all the terms on one side, if I subtract 7 on both sides, this becomes x squared minus 6x plus 2 equals 0. And this is a form that we are likely to see this kind of equation uh, written in. So there must be a way for us to be able to go from this step to that step. And certainly there is. And the way that we proceed here, and this method that I'm about to show you, is called completing the square. Because you notice what we're trying to do. We're going to create a situation from this trinomial to where we have a binomial squared. A binomial squared. Now, in order to factor a trinomial, this trinomial namely, in order to factor that into a binomial squared, this has to be, this is what is referred to as a trinomial square. A square factors into something squared, like 25, a square can factor into 5 squared. So here we're, we're completing the uh, trinomial square. We're completing the square in order to create this factoring opportunity. Well, here's how that, that works. Here's how we get to this position. I'm taking the same uh, quadratic equation now. And what we do in this process is we take the existing constant, the 2, and we subtract it on both sides. We just get rid of it from the left. Now, when I subtract 2 on the right, I get minus 2. Now, notice I'm leaving a position here. I'm leaving a vacancy. And that vacancy is left there for the creation of a new constant. We're going to conjure up a new constant in this position that will cause us to have a trinomial square, which we will factor into a binomial squared. Now, how do we invent this, uh, this new constant? Well, it's very easy. All we do is take half of this coefficient and square it. That's all there is to it. Half of negative 6 is negative 3. Negative 3 squared is 9. So we'll add 9 here. And if we add 9 to this side of the equation, we have to add 9 to this side because we want to maintain the balance of the equation. Whatever we do on one side, we have to do on the other. And uh, now that we have a trinomial square, we factor into a binomial squared. And that binomial turns out to be x minus 3. And on the right, we have uh, minus 2 plus 9 or 7. Now, by the way, this factorization, uh, you might verify this factorization for yourself. Just do it the long way at first. That is, factor into, let's see, x times x for x squared. And the last sign is uh, positive, so the signs are the same. The middle sign is negative, so minus times minus factors of 9. Oh, probably 3 times 3. Verify the middle term. And we have two factors of x minus 3. So we have x minus 3 squared. But this this method depends upon our ability to identify that new constant. So we left a place for the constant, and we invented it by saying it is half of this coefficient squared. So we, we're taking negative 6, divide by 2, take the result, and square it. And that's how we got the 9. OK. Now, from here, the problem is relatively simple. We use this uh, square root property, or extracting square roots, and we have that x minus 3 is equal to plus or minus the square root of 7, or x is equal to 3 plus or minus the square root of 7 as our two uh, solutions. Let's try another one. Here we have, let's see, uh, we might try, by the way, on, on these kinds of problems, we might attempt to, to use the method of factoring. And if once we bump into a brick wall there, or we're unable to, to factor using our normal methods, then we would resort to this uh, this method of completing the square. Well, let's see. We have x squared minus 10x and then equals negative 15. Oh, incidentally, 
I, I mentioned that uh, we might try factoring first, but simply because factoring is a, usually a little bit easier. If it's factorable, it's a little easier than completing the square. But that doesn't mean that the method of completing the square cannot be used on those quadratics that are factorable. So we can use this method of solution on, on any quadratic equations that we care to apply it to. All right, here we go. Completing the square. To, co to invent this constant that will cause us to have a conveniently factorable trinomial, we do this. We take half of this and square it. Half of negative 10 is negative 5. Negative 5 squared, let's see, is 25. So we're going to add 25. Now, look, look at what I'm going to do. Look at how I'm going to write this. I'm taking half of negative 10, and I'm going to square that. Now, half uh, of negative 10 is negative 5, so it's negative 5 that I'm squaring. Now, I want to emphasize that this form of the number that I'm coming up with, and for a particular reason, and I'll tell you about it in a minute, what I'm doing is I'm adding negative 5 squared. Now, it's, it's 25, all right, but I'm going to write it in that form just for the moment. Now, if I add this amount on this side, I have to add the same amount on the other side, and we know that it's 25, and I'll write it as 25 on the right. Now, here's what I want to show you. That when I go through the factoring process here, rather than writing 25 right here and going through that factoring business, I can simply do this. I can identify the binomial here just by looking at the amount that I squared because that amount is going to go right here, and the factoring is especially easy because I've identified specifically the amount that I squared. All right, so it just makes the process a little bit easier. On the right, negative 15 plus 25, oh, that's 10. And now, let's see, by uh, extracting square roots, I know that x minus 5 is equal to plus or minus the square root of 10, or x is equal to, and adding 5 on both sides, uh, x is 5 plus or minus the square root of 10. And those are my two solutions. Now, you may be asking yourself, gee, what happens if this number that I'm taking half of is not an even number? Well, that's what happens in the next example. We have x squared minus 9x minus 5. All right, then we begin the process by taking the existing constant and kicking it out. That is, we add 5 on both sides. All right, now what I need to do is take half of negative 9, that is, I'm taking negative 9, I'm taking half of it, and I'm going to square that amount. All right, now that's what I'm going to add on both sides. All right, I will leave it in this form on the, the left side. So I'm adding, let's see, negative 9 halves squared, and, well, that's a little bit tight. Let me, make, let me clean that up a little bit. I'm adding negative 9 halves squared on both sides. On the right, I had 5. Now I'm going to add, what am I really adding? Squaring uh, the negative gives us a positive result. And squaring 9 halves is 81 fourths. 81 fourths. So I'm adding 81 fourths, really, on both sides. It's just a different way of writing it on these two sides. All right, let's see. The factoring over here is especially easy. It is simply x, and then what amount did I square? Well, I squared minus 9 halves. So I write minus 9 halves squared equals. Now, on the right, I have some collecting to do. I want to bring these two terms together, and here we have a fraction, and I'd like to think of 5 as 5 over 1. So the common denominator then is 4. I'm going to multiply here by 4 over 4. So I'll get 20 over 4 plus 81 over 4. Hmm, let's bring those together in the next step. I have x minus 9 halves squared equals 20 and 81. That's 101 over 4. All right, now I'm ready to, uh, to solve this. And I know by the square root property, or by extracting square roots, I've got uh, x minus 9 halves equal to plus or minus the square root of 101 over 4. Or x is and I'm adding 9 halves on both sides. x is 9 halves plus or minus. Now, think about the square root symbol applying to numerator and denominator. You see, the, uh, I, I want to think about it like that because I can't leave a radical in a denominator. If I have a radical in a denominator, I have to rationalize. 
So let's see. The square root of 101 stays in the numerator, and the square root of 4 would be 2 in the denominator. Now here's our, our, here are our answers. Another way to write this, though, since we have a common denominator here, we could write this as 9 plus or minus the square root of 101 for the numerator, and the denominator is that common denominator, too. So here's a nice, concise way of writing those two answers. Well, here's another variation on the same theme. Notice, however, that in this problem, we have a leading coefficient other than 1, and, and that presents us with a little bit of a dilemma here. We have to deal with that. Well, it, it, it turns out that in order to deal with leading coefficients other than 1, we'll simply take that leading coefficient and divide throughout by it in order to remove it because this uh, business of completing the square only works when the leading coefficient is 1. So we'll march through as a, as a first step. We'll just take every term and divide by that leading coefficient. And it'll get rid of it right quick for us. Now, 3's go out as, as expected. So we have x squared minus, now the 3 and the 12 cancel, leaving 4. So we have 4x. And here we have 7 thirds and 0 on the right. At the same time that I do this, I know that I'm going to have to take this constant and kick it to the right. So let's just subtract 7 thirds on both sides. All right, now we're ready to complete the square, and we proceed as we normally would. And from here, it's a very predictable kind of thing. This would be a good time to stop the tape, try the rest of the problem on your own, and come back and verify your solution. Well, here, completing the square is a relatively easy uh, uh, event because half of negative 4 is negative 2, and negative 2 squared is 4. So I'm adding 4 on both sides. Now, I could write this as negative 2 squared, you see, on this side, but I would certainly want to write 4 on the right side. All right, factoring over here, I get x minus 2 squared, and on the right, I need to collect those two. Think of 4 as 4 over 1, and the common denominator here is 3. So to make this fraction have that common denominator, I'll multiply by 3 over 3. So we have negative 7 thirds plus 12 thirds. Now I'm just collecting those numerators, so I have x minus 2 squared equals negative 7 plus 12 is 5 thirds. All right, now I'm ready to go with uh, extracting square roots. Let's come up here and finish the problem. Uh, I know that I have that, uh, that quantity squared is x minus 2, which is squared. So x minus 2 is equal to plus or minus the square root of the fraction on the right, which is 5 thirds. Now x then is 2 plus or minus the square root of 5 thirds. That's the square root of 5 over the square root of 3, but I can't leave a fraction like that. I need to rationalize, and so I've got 2 plus or minus. Now think about multiplying here by the square root of 3 over the square root of 3. So I get in the numerator the square root of 15, and the denominator I'll get the square root of 9, which is 3. And this then represents my two answers, my solutions to that equation. Incidentally, the, the uh, problems can be uh, easily checked using a scientific calculator or a graphing calculator. I say easily checked, but what we would have to do is evaluate this. You see, evaluate this. And, and what you can do if you're uh, clever and handy with your calculator is put this information in storage. Uh, you know, you, you uh, go through the manipulations here, take the square root of 15, divided by, divide by 3, uh, and add that amount to 2, and you have one of the two solutions, and uh, uh, store that. Now, in the, the graphing, on the graphing calculator, when you press store, the store button, you'll get a little arrow indicator, and, and it's really asking you, how do you want to store this? What do you want to store it as? Just store it as x, you see? So uh, press, this will be on display, and then press store, and then x, and then enter. All right, and now x takes on the value that you just entered for it. So you can enter then to, to verify the solution. Just uh, enter the original equation. Just press in 3x squared minus 12x plus 7, and then press enter again for it to evaluate this expression for the value of x that we just put in for it. And you should get 0 on the calculator display. Well, let's take a look at another one. Notice here again, we have a leading coefficient other than 1. 
And our first priority is to clear that leading coefficient or to create a leading coefficient, which is 1. And we do that by dividing throughout by the 4. So 4x squared then over 4, minus 3x over 4, minus 2 over 4, equals 0 over 4. Now the 4s go out here. We have x squared. I'd like a clear coefficient of x here, so I'll write this as minus 3 fourths x. And then the minus 2 fourths I need to kick away, and I'll throw them to the right side by adding 2 fourths on one side. 2 fourths is 1 half. So 1 half makes its appearance on the right. Of course, 0 over 4 here is simply 0, and it's out of here. OK, so now we're ready to complete the square. This time, we, uh, we have a little bit of manipulation to deal with. We have to take half of that coefficient and square it. So now let's see. Let's just take one thing at a time. We're taking half of negative 3 fourths, and then we're going to square it. All right. This calculation is negative 3 eighths, and this is the amount that we want to square and add on both sides. So here I'm going to add, let's see, negative 3 eighths squared. Now I'll go ahead and expand it on the right side, but I want to write it like this on the left, especially in a problem like this, so that I can factor very easily on the left side. All right, let's see, squaring negative makes it positive. Squaring 3 gives us 9 for the numerator. Squaring 8 is 64. So this is 9 64ths that I'm adding on both sides. All right, let's go through the factoring process. We've got, uh, let's see, x minus 3 eighths squared on the left. On the right, we have some collecting to do. 1 half now, let's see, the common denominator would be 64. 2 into 64 goes 32. So I'll have 32 over 64. Or I can say 2 into 64 goes 32. 32 times 1 is 32. So I have 32 64ths for 1 half. And then plus 9 64ths. Uh, collecting on the right, let's see, x minus 3 eighths squared equals, common denominators, add numerators, 32 plus 9, 41 over 64. Now I'm ready to uh, solve by the square root property or by extracting square roots. Here's my variable term. This amount is equal to plus or minus the square root of that. Let's write it up here. x minus 3 eighths is equal to plus or minus the square root of 41 over 64. So x then is adding 3 eighths on both sides. x is 3 eighths plus or minus. Now the square root symbol applies to both numerator and denominator. So this is the square root of 41 over the square root of 64. So I have x then is 3 eighths plus or minus the square root of 41 over the square root of 64. That's 8. Common denominators, a nice way to write this will be 3 plus or minus the square root of 41 all over that common denominator 8. And here are our two solutions. So far in this chapter, we have examined several methods for solving quadratic equations. We've looked at the method of factoring. We've talked about extracting square roots. We've examined completing the square. Now we're going to go into a fourth method in this chapter called the quadratic formula, but there is another method for solving that we examined in a previous chapter, and that was a method of graphing. Now the method of uh, uh, the, the quadratic formula comes from the completing the square. You see, uh, a quadratic equation can be written in a general form like this, ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero where a, b, and c are real numbers. And just using those variable quantities, a, b, and c, we can apply the method of completing the square to this and uh, develop the quadratic formula. Here's what it looks like. To derive the quadratic formula, we begin with the general form of the quadratic equation. Now we're going to apply the method of completing the square 
Our first thought is perhaps to uh, change out our, our constant term. That is, let's get rid of the constant term on the left side of our equation. We'll subtract c on both sides. Now, the method of completing the square only works when the leading coefficient is 1. So to clear that leading coefficient of a, we'll divide throughout by a. Now, we get the cancellation as expected in our first term, so we'll bring down the x squared. Now, bx over a, we'll write as b over a times x to show the distinct uh, coefficient of the x. And the negative c over a, we'll think of as negative c over a. Now we're ready to complete the square. Now, remember what our prescription was. It was to take the coefficient of that middle term, the coefficient of x, and take half of it, and then square the result. So here we have b over a times 1 half, quantity squared. Now, b over a times 1 half is b over 2a. And b over 2a, all squared, is b squared over 4a squared. Now, that's the amount we'll add to both sides of our equation. Now we're ready to factor on the left. Now, remember what that amount was that we squared. We squared b over 2a. So the factoring is particularly easy on the left side. On the right, we want to do a collection of uh, our two fractions. Our first thought, though, is perhaps to put the fractions in another order, just listing the positive fraction first or the one with the plus sign before it, before the other one. And now we're ready to find a common denominator. Now notice the common denominator is 4a squared. So we'll multiply in the second fraction by 4a over 4a. This will give us 4ac over 4a squared. Now we can bring the two fractions together. So we have b squared minus 4ac over 4a squared. Now notice that we can uh, apply extracting square roots to our problem to write x plus b over 2a on the left side. And that'll be equal to the plus or minus the square root of that right side fraction. Now we know we can think of the square root of the numerator separate from the square root of the denominator. So we think of the problem like this. And in the denominator, the plus or minus square root of 4a squared will give us plus or minus 2 the, the absolute value of a. You see, the square root of the 4 gives 2. The square root of a squared gives absolute a. But plus or minus 2, the absolute value of a, is the same thing as 2a. Well, now we'd like to clear that b over 2a from the left side, so we'll subtract b over 2a from both sides. Now notice that we have a common denominator. Bringing the fractions together, we get our quadratic formula. To use the quadratic formula, first write the quadratic equation in general form. That means just put all the terms on one side of the equation. Here we would subtract 14 on both sides and write x squared plus 5x minus 14 equals 0. Now it's real easy to identify the components, the parts within the quadratic formula, the a, b, and c involved. Now the next thing we'll do is write down the formula x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. It's important to commit this to memory. In the next step, we replace letters with numbers. And that's all that we want to do. We don't want to go uh, performing operations in this next step. The first two steps are predetermined in this uh, situation, in this process. First step, write the formula. In the next step, replace letters with numbers. All right, now the letters a, b, and c correspond with uh, the coefficient of x squared. That's the a value. The b value is 5 in this case, and negative 14 for c. So minus b or negative b means negative 5. Plus or minus the square root of b squared means 5 squared. Minus 4 times a is understood 1 times c is negative 14 all over 2a, which is 2 times 1. So cleaning up or performing indicated operations, we have minus 5, plus or minus. The square root of 5 squared is 25. Uh, minus 4, or negative 4 times negative 14, would be plus 
56, all over 2 times 1, 2. Simplifying under the radical, we have, let's see, 25 and 56, that's 81, all over 2. Now, the square root of 81 is 9, so we have minus 5 plus or minus 9 over 2. And this gives us our two answers involved in this, in this problem. It's minus 5 plus 9 over 2 and minus 5 minus 9 over 2. So let's simplify here. One of them would be uh, negative 5 plus 9 in the numerator would be 4. 4 over 2 would be 2. So x equals 2 is one answer. The other answer uh, is minus 5 minus 9. That would be negative 14 over 2, which is negative 7. So x is equal to negative 7. Now, I mentioned a few moments ago that uh, quadratic equations can be solved by a number of methods. One of the methods we, I spoke of or referred to is the method of graphing, which we looked at in a previous chapter. Let's refresh our memory about that uh, process using this equation. Now, one thing we have to do to set this up for graphing is we need to, to write this in a, in a form of y equals uh, some expression. And we do that by simply taking the zero involved in our equation and replacing it with y. So this is x squared plus 5x. This is the way we think about it for entry into the graphing calculator. So we let zero be replaced with y. So it's y equals, and then we'll enter that expression. Now what we're looking for graphically, just to refresh your memory, is the, uh, the x-intercepts, the places where the graph crosses the x-axis. Those are the solutions to the equation. And no wonder, the x-intercepts are the places on the graph where y is equal to zero. You see, it's the spot where y becomes zero graphically. And no wonder then uh, it solves the, or that idea solves this equation. Well, let's have a look at the graph. The equation has already been entered, and on standard settings, the graph looks like this. As uh, we have seen so many times in the past, when we press uh, trace using standard settings, uh, we find it a little difficult to locate uh, x-intercepts. So what we'll want to do is uh, create friendly settings by going to zoom and then number 4 for z decimal. But unfortunately, we can't see very much of our graph. We can press trace, and we can trace over to that uh, intersection point rather easily, but we still can't see a great deal of the graph. Let's uh, look at uh, the lower part of the graph by pressing window and uh, just dropping our, our view down a little bit with y minimum. Let's make it negative 22. And then the graph looks like this. Now, pressing trace allows us to see our icon move as we trace to the right, and we can verify one solution as the x-intercept here at x equals 2. The other solution is over to the left. Now, we could uh, change the window settings, but I'd like to show you another way to proceed here. I'm just cursoring over by uh, pressing the left arrow button and leaving it depressed, and I'm all the way over here to the left of the screen. Look at what happens when I press the left arrow button again. The, uh, the viewing window automatically moves over for me, and as I get near the edge of the window, it'll continue to move over. This is a rather nice feature to allow me to, to get to the other point of intersection without actually having to change window settings. And here I'm just verifying the solution that we uh, talked about earlier algebraically as negative 7. The other one was at 2, remember. This quadratic equation is already in the general form, so we'll write down the formula. Now notice this time the variable is a, so the formula takes on a little bit different form. We're solving for a, so instead of x equals, you see it'll be a that we're looking for is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Now a then is negative b is 5 plus or minus the square root of b squared means 5 squared minus 4 times a is 1 times c is 2. And all of this is over 2 times 1. All right, cleaning up, performing indicated operations. We have negative 5 plus or minus the square root of 5 squared is 25 uh, minus 4 times 2, that'd be minus 8 all over 2. 
a then is minus 5 plus or minus the square root of 17 all over 2. Now this is about as far as we can go with this problem because we can't uh, take the square root of a non-square evenly. So we'll leave our answer in this form. Now it would be possible to use a calculator to uh, develop or, or calculate an approximation for the solutions to this problem. It's pretty easy to enter the square root of 17 and find that amount and then subtract 5 and divide that amount by 2 and then take the negative of 17 for the other, uh, the negative of the square root of 17 for the other value, uh, subtract 5 and uh, divide by 2. So we could get a, an approximation rather easily. But we'll leave it in this, in this form algebraically. Consider this next problem. Oh, by the way, the, the answers in that problem were, uh, would be irrational because we can't take the square root of 17 evenly. So we get a couple of irrational answers. In this one, uh, again, we are in the general form. So uh, let's see. x is minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And plugging in, we have x equals uh, minus negative 12. It's the negative of whatever b is, and b is negative 12. So it's the negative of negative 12 here, plus or minus the square root of b is squared, and b is negative 12, so it's negative 12 squared, minus 4 times a is 4 times c is 9. All of this is over 2 times 4. And then performing indicated operations, this is 12, plus or minus the square root of negative 12 squared is 144. The product of negative 4, 4, and 9 would be negative 144. So minus 144. All of this is over 8. And x then is 12 plus or minus the square root of 0 over 8, but the square root of 0 is 0, so this simply becomes 12 eighths, which becomes reducing 3 over 2, or 1 and 1 half. Now, the problems that we looked at before had two solutions. It's possible for quadratic equations to have no real numbered solutions, or one real numbered solution like this, or uh, two real numbered solutions. We can't have more than two, but we can have less than two real numbered solutions. In this next one, z is the variable, so we'll write the formula as z equals minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac. All of this is over 2a. z then is, let's see, minus b means minus negative 4 plus or minus the square root of b squared means negative 4 squared minus 4 times a is 3 times c is 2 all over 2a means 2 times 3. All right, so z then is 4 plus or minus the square root of negative 4 squared is 16. And negative 4 times 3 would be negative 12 times 2, negative 24. 2 times 3, 6 for the denominator. Now, performing indicated operations under the radical, we have the square root of 16 minus 24 is negative 8. And all of this is over 6. Now, we've said before that uh, this does not represent a real number. The square root of a negative number is not a real number. So here, we have no real numbered solution. That doesn't mean that there's no mathematical solution here. In a, in a future algebra course, you're going to talk about sets of numbers that go beyond the set of real numbers. But for our purposes here, we simply say that we have no real numbered solution at this point. Now, we have done a, a number of problems here. And there's something I'd like to point out to you. And that is that the, the type of answer, the, the set of numbers that the answer is within, the smallest set of numbers that the answer is within, can be identified easily by looking at the value under the radical. Now this value under the radical, the b squared minus 4ac, tells us what kind of answer we're going to get for the solutions to our uh, 
quadratic equation. And for that reason, that b squared minus 4ac is sometimes called the discriminant, the discriminant, because it calls attention to the difference between the kinds of answers that we get. Now, let's go back and examine the kinds of answers that we got in these problems. You see here, if the discriminant is a negative number, if the discriminant is negative, then we get no real numbered solutions. And then in the previous problem, we found that the discriminant turns out to be zero. Now, the, remember, the discriminant is the number under the radical, the b squared minus 4ac part. That's the discriminant. The discriminant was zero here. And in that circumstance, the answer turned out to be, well, remember now, this is negative b. You see, it's negative b over 2a. And, and that number will end up being a rational number in all cases, as long as uh, these uh, coefficients and the constant are real numbers. Then this rascal is going to be rational when the discriminant is 0. So if we wanted to, you see, in a problem that uh, is a quadratic equation, we could just evaluate b squared minus 4ac and calculate the kind of answer we're going to get. Let's look at the other kinds that we got here. When the discriminant is a positive number, but not a square, you see, we can't take the square root of it evenly, then the answers that we get here, the two answers were irrational values. If that uh, number under the, the radical, the discriminant, is a positive square, then we can take the square root of that square evenly, and our answers turn out to be rational. Here, they actually turned out to be integers. But at, at worst, they would end up being rational if we were unable to uh, resolve this or reduce the fraction into integers. So the idea is that the discriminant can tell us whether we get rational, two rational answers, as in this case, one rational answer if the discriminant turns out to be 0, or if the discriminant turns out to be a positive non-square, then the answers turn out to be we get two irrational answers. And if the discriminant is a negative number, whether it's a square or not, it doesn't matter. If the number is negative, then the answers are not real numbers. Since we have a number of options at our disposal for dealing with quadratic equations, it might be important for us to just talk about what option we might select if we have a choice. Often a problem set will say, solve this by this set by completing the square, solve that one by factoring, and solve by using the formula. Well, what if we have the option? You see, how do we make a decision? Well, look at this equation. Sometimes the, the decision uh, uh, can be made rather easily. Sometimes it's a little difficult. Here, it's rather easy. What I notice about this, and what I'd like you to notice, is there is no first degree variable term, no first degree term here. And when there's no first degree term, your, your option is to use the, the, uh, the extracting square roots method. And that, that's an awfully good option to take. Now, this particular problem, because this term is a square, and that term is a square, and this is the difference of squares, we could rather easily factor here. But uh, fundamentally, all of those quadratic equations that are in uh, standard form like this, or general form like this, without the first degree term, can be solved by extracting square roots. Here's what I'm talking about. We'll take the constant and throw it to the other side. Adding 49 on both sides, we'll get this. And then I'd like to isolate the variable, which is squared. So I'll divide on both sides by 4. And we'll have u squared, then, is 49 over 4. And now we'll use this method of extracting square roots. We know that the variable that's squared here is plus or minus the square root of 49 over 4. And we think about the square root of 49 is 7, and the square root of 4 is 2. So plus or minus 7 halves represent our two solutions. Here's another kind of uh, equation that can face us. Now, we've, we've faced a number of uh, equations that contain fractions. And our first order of business is to remove the fractions and not to try to identify some uh, fancy method of solution. We don't know, for example, 
uh, just looking at a, an equation with fractions, whether or not the overall equation will degenerate to a linear equation or to a quadratic equation, much less what kind of quadratic it might turn out to be. So don't worry about uh, how it's going to, to take shape. Simply concentrate on removing the fractions. Here, the fractions can be removed by identifying a common denominator and multiplying throughout by that common denominator. The common denominator contains every different factor that we see. So the common denominator will contain r plus 1 and also contain r as factors. So we'll have r times r plus 1 that we're multiplying times every one of these terms. So we'll write that down, r times r plus 1 times every term. Now, back over here, we can see the cancellation of the r plus 1s. 2 times r is 2r. Whoops, 2r. And uh, here, the r's cancel, and we have 2 times r plus 1, which is 2r plus 2. On the right, multiplying 1 times r times r plus 1. Let's see, r times r, r squared. Then r times 1 is r. At this point, we can identify the type of equation that we're facing. And we see that we have a, a second degree term, and so we know it's a quadratic equation. Let's put the equation into uh, a, a general form, and then maybe we'll examine it a little bit and determine what method we want to use for solution. All right, on the left, we can collect a couple of terms. First of all, we have 4r plus 2 over here, and on the right, r squared plus r. Now, I'd like all the terms on one side. I think I'll throw them to the right this time because I have a leading coefficient here, which is positive, and I, I want that condition, especially if I'm going to factor. So I'll throw the terms to the right rather than to the left. All right, so I've got r squared plus r over there now. When uh, I remove 4r from the left, I'm subtracting 4r on both sides. So I'll have minus 4r appearing on the right. Subtracting 2 on both sides, I get minus 2 on the right. Now I've got 0 equals r squared. r minus 4r is minus 3r, and then minus 2. Now we would look at the, the quadratic equation and try to make a decision about the type of uh, method that we're going to use for solution. We might attempt to factor, first of all. This is a relatively simple quadratic. If it was very complicated and uh, the factoring process would be lengthy, then I would decide to go right to the quadratic formula. Just bang, just go right to it, no questions asked, and just, you know, you almost save time by making that quick decision rather than hassling over whether or not to factor or how do we factor this. This one is relatively easy to examine in terms of factoring, but just a, a close, uh, just a, a quick look will tell you that this is unfactorable using the methods that we are familiar with. So we would go right to the quadratic formula. Now notice I'm not using extracting square roots as, a, as an option here, and I'm not using uh, completing the square as an option. Completing the square was a, is a method of solution that really is a stepping stone from uh, factoring to the uh, quadratic formula. You see, it's not really used for uh, in all practical purposes, but it is used for, for other things in mathematics. In other mathematical structures, the completing the square method has to be used, and it's used rather often, as a matter of fact. So it's a valuable thing to know, a valuable mathematical tool. All right, let's use the formula on this. Now, what I would do is I'm going to repeat the equation up here just for reference purposes. We have r squared, let's see, minus 3r minus 2. And uh, since we're solving for r, I'll write the e formula in terms of r. So I have r equals minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac. All of this is over 2a. So r then is minus negative uh, 3 plus or minus the square root of negative 3 squared uh, minus 4 times a is 1 times c is negative 2. And all of this is over 2 times 1. All right, so r then is, let's see, the negative of negative 3 would be 3 plus or minus the square root of negative 3 squared is 9, negative 4 times negative 2, that's plus 8, and all of this is over 2. So r then is 
3 plus or minus the square root of 9 and 8 17 all over 2. And this is as far as we need to go algebraically. We may want to go further if we were uh, estimating or approximating our two solutions using a calculator, but for our algebraic purposes, here are our two solutions. Let's investigate aspects of the graph of this equation using the graph and calculator. The one thing we might notice here while we look at the equation is that the leading coefficient is positive and therefore the graph will open up. But we really don't know where our x-intercepts are, or even if we have any at this point. But, uh, so let's put it onto the graph and calculator. Now on the graph and calculator, notice that I have entered the coefficient one-third with parenthesis around the one-third in order to assure ourselves that the x squared uh, does not appear as a factor within the denominator. So it's just a precautionary measure here in entering the equation onto the calculator. Using standard settings, the graph looks like this. Now we're looking for uh, x-intercepts and we're looking for the position of the vertex. We know from experience that on standard settings, our trace button is going to give us some rather unfriendly val values for x and y. Now we might accommodate that by going zoom and then number four. And a uh, graph comes up, we get a closer view of the graph and certain aspects it, of it are missing, but pressing trace and I'm gonna attempt to trace to the position of this uh, x-intercept. Now notice I have a y component positive here and negative in this position, so I'm sort of straddling the x-intercept. The x-intercept itself is not at a friendly uh, value. And if I investigate aspects of the equation, if I calculate uh, the x-intercepts uh, using the quadratic formula, that is let y be zero and solve the, uh, the quadratic equation, I'll find out that the x-intercepts are indeed irrational. Now, because of that, they are never-ending and never-repeating decimals. That is, when, if I could create a situation where the y value is zero, then this would be a never-ending and never-repeating decimal. So the best I can do here is approximate the x-intercept. Now, I can do that on the graph and calculator rather easily. I can get a great deal of accuracy by doing this. I can press zoom and then I can zoom in on a particular spot. Now pressing enter uh, with zoom in gives me a little icon, and I'll let you see it here. This is just a centering icon, and we're just identifying the place on the graph where we want to zoom into. And if I press enter, you see now my centering icon is here. I'll just try to put it on the intercept, and I'll press enter again. And we can press enter as many times as we want to and get closer and closer and closer and closer to an actual x-intercept. Now, notice that the y component is zero here, but this is not a place that is on the graph. Well, I assure myself that I'm on the graph by pressing the trace button, and now I have a blinking icon right on the graph. And I will cursor over and attempt to get that icon to appear right on the uh, the graph, and it's not doing so here. Notice that this is a positive number, 0 0.0035 and so on for y, and as I go over, I have a negative value, negative 9.33, but the e and then the minus 5 means that this is scientific notation. This is very, very close to that x-axis. The y distance, the vertical distance, is a very, very tiny number. So this icon is blinking in a spot which is very, very close to an x-intercept. And that means that this value of x is very close to, uh, to my, my x-intercept value or to a solution to the equation 0 equals uh, that uh, expression on the right side of the equation that we looked at before. Now, I'd like to show you, let me, let me just straddle this once again. Let's see, I'm, I'm, I want to straddle it by going from the negative value to the positive value. And look at the uh, digits uh, that are on x, the x component here, that are changing as I go back and forth here. You see, and I can get fewer and fewer digits to change if I just zoom in further and further and further, and it just gives me a, a more and more accurate value for x as the, uh, the x-intercept. Uh, if I zoom in, for example, right here, 
my blinking icon is in the place where I want it, so I'll press Enter. And there's my centering icon again. I'll press Enter again and Enter again. And very quickly, we get an awful lot of accuracy. I'm pressing Trace to place the icon onto the graph. And uh, now notice that the, the Y component is for either negative or positive values is in scientific notation. So these are very, very small vertical distances for Y. And uh, notice that as I go back and forth from the positive and negative Y components, how the X components are changing. Now notice the first, dig the first three digits to the right of the decimal are not changing at all. And the last several are changing. So with, with a great deal of assurity, we can say that uh, a good approximation for one of the x-intercepts is negative 0.464, you see. And, uh, and then we can do the same thing for the other intercept on the other side. All right, let's go to uh, a, a more familiar setting here. Let's go to the z, z decimal. I'm pressing number 4 and we get a wider view of our graph. Now if I press trace and I'm trying to identify the position of my vertex, I'll cursor over and notice how the blinking icon leaves the viewing screen at about this point and I can no longer see where I am. Well I'd like to be able to see where I am uh, because I want the lowest point on the graph. I want to identify that. So I can achieve that by, now notice that the the calculator doesn't automatically move its, its viewing down as it did left and right. It doesn't move up and down in the same fashion. So I have to make that change using a, a change in window settings. The Y minimum is what I want to change. I'll change it to, let's say, negative 08. And let's see if that accomplishes what I'm after. Yes, I can see the bottom of the graph here, which is the position of the vertex. So I'll press trace, and I'll trace over to that lowest point. Now what I, I want visually, I can, I can look to see if I'm near the lowest point, but uh, with my XY components, I just want the lowest value of Y. And as I cursor over, I see that it's at negative 4. So the X component 3 and the Y component uh, negative 4 give me the position of the vertex. I could have verified this another way, as you know. Algebraically, I could have used the equation and I could have evaluated negative b over 2a for the x component and then figured out what y needs to be. All right, let me show you something else uh, that is a value with uh, investigating uh, equations and graphs and so forth. Let's go back to uh, a standard setting here, number 6, and uh, the graph has this behavior. And now press Y equals. And I'd like to make a change in our equation and try to notice the resulting change in the graph. If I use the same coefficient here, this one third in parenthesis, close parenthesis, now I want X squared minus 2X. And now this time I'll put in minus, oh, let's say 5. And now I'd just like to see how changing the uh, constant will change the graphs. So pressing graph, here's the, the graph of the first equation, and here's the graph of the second equation. Oh, changing the constant simply moved that second graph down a little bit on the coordinate plane. This uh, second graph has the same shape. You see it's, it has the same sort of fatness that the first one had, but it just moved it down a little bit on the coordinate plane. So investigations like this can take place very quickly uh, by using the graphing calculator. And that's one of the great advantages of using the graphing calculator in this investigative process. A lot of times if you investigate this enough, you'll learn uh, just by looking at equations as to how the, the graphs are going to behave. Now I'm taking this one offline, and I'm going to enter another one here, another equation, but it's going to be very similar to the first one. Let's, uh, let's write in, let's change the leading coefficient to 2 this time and write x squared and then minus 2x and then minus 1 and see what kind of changes we get. All right, here's our original graph. And uh, now this graph, oh, well, we, we moved uh, the, the graphs. Let's see, the second graph moved left and right. It moved a little bit up and down, it appears. But uh, most significantly, it, it changed its shape 
a great deal. It became a lot thinner here than the original graph. And that fundamentally is the, is the major change that occurs when we change the leading coefficient. And we make that kind of investigation just by changing the equation and observing the graph. So the, and this is something that you can do on your own. And we'll make a real study of this as we get to uh, 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 the next algebra course and then, uh, and then into college algebra. A rather vast and colorful uh, variety of word problems lend themselves to a quadratic mathematical model for a solution. As a matter of fact, some of the families of word problems that we've already investigated uh, evolve into a quadratic model for a solution. We're going to survey a number of different kinds of problems now. Uh, I would invite you, I would ask you to read this section in your, in your textbook and look at the problems that are there. The more exposure you have to different kinds of problems, the better equipped you're going to be to deal in this kind of situation uh, because there is such a vast variety. So look at the ones in the text and then look at the ones on the board here that, that we show and you'll be well prepared for your homework. All right, this one says the sum of the squares of two consecutive integers is 481. Find the integers. The sum of the squares of two consecutive integers. Well, if we let x equal the first integer then the next consecutive integer, the integer right after that one, would be x plus 1. So that's going to be the second integer. And it says the sum of the squares of these integers is 481. So to build a mathematical model, it's the, the square of this one plus the square of that one is equal to 481. So it's going to be x squared plus x plus 1 squared equals 481. Now, uh, I failed to mention it earlier, but uh, I want to tell you that this is a great time to try the problem on your own and come back and look at the solution uh, that we're going to provide. But just setting up this part of the problem is a, is a big part of going toward that solution. And of course, setting up the mathematical model is too. Well, let's see. We're, uh, we're squaring the x plus 1, so we'll get, let's see, x squared plus we get x squared plus 2x plus 1 equals 481. Now we see that we have a quadratic uh, equation, so we'll put all the terms on one side. x squared and x squared would be 2x squared. And uh, then plus 2x plus 1 equals 481. I want to subtract 481 on both sides. So I'll have uh, 2x squared plus 2x then uh, subtract 481 over here. We have minus 481 plus 1. That's minus 480 equals 0. And now let's come up over here. Uh, I'm going to just repeat this step. So we have 2x squared plus 2x minus 480 equals 0. Factoring a 2 out of all three terms, we have 2 times x squared plus x minus 240 equals 0. Now, to factor here, think about this. We're far enough along to where we can do this. x times x gives x squared. The last sign is negative, so we have plus times minus. And we know that this product is going to be 240. We also know that we're collecting the, uh, these two terms, that is, something x minus something x to give 1x. That simply means that the numbers that belong in these positions differ by 1 only. So we want two numbers that when multiplied give 240, but whose difference is going to be exactly 1. Now, uh, we might investigate for, for those two numbers there. We know they're integers because we're looking for integers here in this problem. And if we know they're integers, we know we can factor uh, this quadratic form. So investigate it uh, kind of like this. I mean, we could use trial and error, but just look into your calculator and uh, how do you think about how you request uh, a number times itself to be 240. You see, exactly. A number times itself to be 240, well, that's the square root. That's all the square root means. So take the square root of 240, and you'll find it's a number between 15 and 16. It's 15 point something, something, something. Okay, the numbers are 15 and 16, you see. And so we can very quickly uh, use that kind of analogy. That's the value of, 
of mathematics in a, in, a, in a true sense, that you get a pretty good feeling for situations like this, and then you apply it, uh, something in mathematics. It's, it's not something that you memorize or something like that a lot of times. Well, let's see, it's uh, 15 times 16. I'll put the 16 here, the 15 here, and away we go. The value of x that causes each factor to become zero. The, no x is in here, so this doesn't contribute to the list of uh, solutions. Uh, this uh, factor becomes zero when x itself is negative 16. This factor becomes zero when x is 15. Now, these are values of x. We were asked to find uh, uh, the two integers. Let's see, we want the sum of the squares of two consecutive integers is 481. Find the integers. What are these consecutive integers? Well, let's see. One of them could be negative 16. One of them could be 15. Now, it turns out that we actually have two sets of consecutive integers that solve this dilemma. Uh, and that is that if x is negative 16, then x plus 1 means negative 16 plus 1, or negative 15. On the other hand, if x is 15, then x plus 1 is 16. So one set of solutions, one solution set would be that the two integers are negative 16 and negative 15. Or we could say, or and we could say, that the uh, two consecutive integers are 15 and 16. A lot of times this quadratic form will lead to two sets of an answers. And the important thing here is to notice that these are not our two consecutive integers. These, are, these represent the first of two consecutive integers you see that we're going to identify. A radio station advertises that its broadcasts are heard over a circular region covering approximately 10,000 square miles. Approximate the distance between the station and the listeners farthest from the station. The problem says that the listening area is 10,000 square miles, and, it, and it's illustrated like this. If, if this is the location of the station, then the station is broadcasting, you see, in all directions. All right, and the area that is covered uh, by the, the station broadcast is 10,000 square miles. Okay, and that's all of this area within this circle. Now, if we're going to calculate the, uh, the distance to the farthest listeners, then what we want is the distance to the folks that are right out here on the edge of the listening uh, area at the edge of this circle. So we're really trying to calculate the radius of this circle. So we use the formula for the area of a circle. Area is pi times radius squared, and we just put information into the... Uh, into that formula. Now notice that the mathematical model here is a formula. We didn't have to conjure up some kind of a quadratic relationship. It's built into the nature of this kind of problem. So all right, we have an area of 10,000. Pi we know is a constant and uh, we just bring down r squared. Dividing by pi on both sides. Divide by pi over here and we get a cancellation. Divide by pi over here and we have this fraction. Now we can use this uh, square root uh, property or s extracting square roots to find that r is the square root of that number. Now, actually, r is plus or minus the square root of that fraction, but we know that we're looking for a distance, and by the nature of this problem, we're looking for a positive value. So we can eliminate this r minus part of the problem. So it's, a, it's the positive uh, square root here that we're looking for. And the approximation for uh, the uh, square root of that fraction is 56.4, and since we're talking about an area here of square miles, the radius is going to be in some number of miles. So it's approximately 56.4, or 4 tenths, miles. A model rocket is projected upward from ground level according to the height equation h is equal to negative 16 t squared plus 192 t, where h is the height in feet and t is the time in seconds. After how many seconds will the height be 432 feet? Well, here, of course, we're given a height, and so we'll replace h in our equation with 432. 
Now to begin the solution, we'll subtract 432 on both sides to have all terms on one side of our quadratic equation. Now, of course, our prescription is to factor. We see a common factor of, of 16, and actually we'll take out that entire leading coefficient of negative 16. When we factor the negative 16, we get t squared minus 12t plus 27. Now factoring the trinomial in parenthesis, we get t minus 3 times t minus 9. The values of t that cause each factor to become 0 are 3 and 9. Now you may be wondering how it's possible for two different times to give a height of 432 feet. Well, here's how. You see, as the rocket flies, it goes through that 432-foot level on the way up, and then it comes back down and goes through that 432-foot level again. So we say then that the rocket will be at a height of 432 feet after three seconds going up, and again after nine seconds coming down. Consider another part to this problem. When will the rocket hit the ground? Well, we go back to our basic equation, and we let h be 0. And we can do that because the height is 0 when the rocket is on the ground. Now to solve our equation, we can solve by factoring. But another technique we can use here is to divide throughout by negative 16. Now when we do that, the equation looks like this. Well, now we can take out the common factor t and uh, find the values of t that cause each factor to be 0. We find t to be either 0 or 12. Now, t stands for some amount of time. t equals 0 because after no time has elapsed, the rocket is on the ground. Well, that's before liftoff, you see. And then the rocket is on the ground again after 12 seconds. So we say the rocket will hit the ground after 12 seconds. A windlass is used to pull a boat to the dock. The rope is attached to the boat at a point 15 feet below the level of the windlass. Find the distance from the boat to the dock when the length of the rope is 75 feet. A windlass is a device that allows us to sort of reel in our boat uh, whenever we're ready to use it. The windlass is situated like this. It's on a stanchion, and, and this is the part where we just reel in that boat. Actually, we'd be reeling this way if this uh, knob is on this side and the rope is attached to the top. Well, this rope is 75 feet long, and the level of the, of the boat here is 15 feet below the top of the windlass, and we're asked to, to calculate the distance from our dock uh, to the boat or this distance. Now, notice that we have a right triangle kind of configuration here. And by the nature of the problem, then we understand that we're going to use a formula. And the formula is the Pythagorean theorem, or c squared is equal to a squared plus b squared. Now, c is always the longest side of a right triangle. It's always the side opposite the right angle. So in this case, the c is 75. So 75 squared is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. Now, we can let a be the variable that we're looking for, or b. And I simply let, I just brought down a as the, the thing that we're looking for here, and I let b be the value 15. So 15 is squared. Now, subtracting 15 squared on both sides, I get this. And if a squared, our variable squared, is equal to this amount, then it means that a, by extracting square roots, is the square root of the difference of these squares. Now, a couple of things are important to, to, for me to point out here. One is that I didn't write plus or minus here because we're looking for a distance, which is going to be, by necessity, positive. So I didn't write the negative component here. And also, I want to point out that this idea of square rooting is not distributive. And that's why I wrote the 75 squared minus 15 squared in this form. This is not simply 75 minus 15. We cannot uh, take the square root of this component minus the square root of that component, you see. All right, so the notion is put this information into the calculator and uh, approximate uh, that distance. A is approximately seven, 73 and a half feet. So that boat is ab about 73 and a half feet from the dock. Now notice that it's, that amount, that distance, is reasonable because it just makes sense that if this is 75 feet, 
that the distance from the dock to the boat is a little bit less than that, and certainly that number is a little bit less than 75, so it is reasonable. Here's a problem involving a hot air balloon. The problem says an object is dropped from a balloon 1,600 feet above the ground. Find the time it takes for the object to reach the ground. Of course, we need a relationship between distance and time for a freely falling object. Well, that relationship is d is equal to 16t squared. Now remember, the distance is 1,600 feet, so we simply replace d with 1,600. Since we see that we have a quadratic situation, we intend to solve by factoring. First, though, we'll clear the 1600 from the left side by subtracting 1600 on both sides of the equation. Now we're ready to factor. Taking out the common factor 16, we're left with t squared minus 100, the difference of squares, which we now factor into t plus 10 times t minus 10. Now we know that t is equal to negative 10, or t is equal to 10. Of course, only the positive value makes sense in this case. So we know then that uh, the time that we're after is 10 seconds, and we can write our answer. The object takes 10 seconds to reach the ground. Gee, the object takes 10 seconds to reach the ground. The next part of the problem says how far is the object from the ground after 5 seconds of free fall? You see, if it takes 10 seconds to reach the ground, does it make sense that it's halfway to the ground after 5 seconds? Well, let's see. Let's go back to our equation. d is equal to 16t squared. And now we want to know something about uh, the distance when the time is 5 seconds. So we'll just replace t with 5. Of course, 5 squared is 25. And now 16 times 25 will give us the distance that the object has fallen. The object has fallen only 400 feet after 5 seconds. Well, let's see how far from the ground it is. If it has fallen 400 feet, then all we need to do is take the total distance from the ground, 1,600 feet, and subtract the distance that it has fallen. So we get 1,200. So now we're ready to write our answer. The object is 1,200 feet above the ground after five seconds of free fall. Working together, two people can complete a task in four hours. Working alone, one person takes six hours longer than the other. How long would it take each to do the task alone? Let's organize what we know. We know that the time it takes the two people working together is four hours, and we need to represent the time that it takes each of the two people. Let's also give them names. I've named these two individuals Joe and Jim. Now, if we let x be Joe's time, that is, the time that Joe is required to do this job, and the other person takes six hours longer, then Jim's time required to do the job is x plus 6. All right, now we build our mathematical model like this. Remember, with work rate problems, or combined work kinds of problems, we think about what is happening in one unit of time. Now, the unit of time here is hours. So what is happening in one hour? You see. What portion of the job can Joe do in one hour? If Joe takes X hours to do the whole job, then in one hour, what fraction of the job is being accomplished? And it's simply the reciprocal of that X. It is 1 over X. So Joe can accomplish this fraction of the job in one hour. Now, to assure ourselves that we understand that, understand that if the amount of time that is required for Joe to do the job is, let's say, five hours, if Joe can do the job in five hours, then in one hour, Joe is accomplishing one-fifth of the job, the reciprocal of five. So we're talking about the reciprocal of x. In a similar way, the, the uh, amount of the job, the portion of the job that Jim is accomplishing in one hour is the reciprocal of x plus six. It is simply one over x plus six. Now, this is what those two fellows are accomplishing in one hour together. We're simply adding the portion of the job done by one plus the portion done by the other. All together, what are they accomplishing? Well, if it uh, requires them uh, four hours to complete the whole job, then in one hour, they are together completing one-fourth of the job. All right, so now we have a mathematical model. 
Now, notice with, uh, with fractions in an equation, our prescription for solution would be to identify a common denominator, multiply through by the common denominator to clear the fractions. Let's do that. The common denominator contains every different factor that we see, which means the common denominator contains 4 as a factor, x as a factor, and x plus 6 as a factor. So we're going to take 4 times x times x plus 6 and multiply times every term. Oops, x plus 6, my bad. Stand by. All right, let's simplify. Back over here, we have the x is canceling. 4 times x plus 6 is 4x plus 24. And then here, the x plus 6 is canceled, so 4x times 1 is 4x. And on the right, the 4s go out, so we have x times x plus 6, x squared plus 6x. All right, now I'm noticing that I have a quadratic equation because of this second degree term. Now, I'd like to, to clean things up on the left side. Uh, let's do that and bring the problem up here. 4x plus 4x would be 8x on the left, and then plus 24 I'll bring down. On the right, I have x squared plus 6x. Now, I'd like to solve by factoring if I can, but uh, when I have a quadratic equation, the safe thing to do is to throw all the terms to one side and simplify, and then we can make some decisions about how we want to attack the problem. So let's see, I'll take these terms and throw them to that side, and I'll have, let's see, I've got x squared plus 6x on the right. I subtract 8x on both sides, so we'll have minus 8x over here. Then I'll subtract 24 on both sides, so I'll have minus 24. Now, collecting on the right, I get x squared minus 2x minus 24. And I'll try to solve by factoring. Looks like it's pretty easy to factor. Let's see if that's not the case. We have x times x for x squared. The last sign is negative, so plus times minus. Factors of 24 whose difference is 2. That would be 6 and 4. So we have 6, 4. All right, let's see. Values of x, it will cause each of the factors to become 0. This factor is 0 when x is negative 4. This factor is 0 when x is 6. Now, what are we looking for in the problem? We're looking for the amount of time required to do a job. Well, it doesn't make a lot of sense to, to have negative time involved, so this, uh, this solution to the equation doesn't make sense as it applies to our problem. So x is 6. Now, x stood for the amount of time that Joe requires to do this job. So let's see. Uh, Joe's time then is 6 hours takes Jim six hours longer than it does Joe. So x plus six would be Jim's time from over there, but, Jim, but Joe's time is six, so it's six plus six or 12. So Jim's time is 12 hours. Now this is assuming that they're working alone. So this is Joe's time is six hours if he does the job alone. Jim's time is 12 hours if he does the job working alone.